Daniel, Daniel chapter 5, verses 5 through 9. Let's read this passage responsively, and we'll all begin on verse 5. So read with me, please, on verse 5, and then every other verse down through verse 9 here tonight out of Daniel chapter 5. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. And the king spake and said to the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and show me the interpretation thereof shall be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then came in all the king's wise men, but they could not read the writing nor make known to the king the interpretation thereof. Then was King Belshazzar greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed in him, and his lords were astonished. Father, again, thank you for these. Lord, the story that we just read, and thank you for the word of God that we hold in our hands. What a gift, and thank you for you, Lord, and your, the special gift, Lord, that you are to each of us. I pray tonight you would, again, bless the message and fill our preacher with your spirit, minister to hearts, challenge us, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, maybe see you. the pen, appreciate that, and appreciate you all reading the word of God. Blesses my heart to hear it read. Thank you so very, very much. One of the great disasters, you've heard me say this about a hundred dozen times, that one of the great disasters in our churches today are the many different uh, translations that have been introduced into the audience. There's no longer any public reading of God's word together because everybody has a different uh, version, and I just am thankful for you all's unity. I appreciate that. Tonight, the Bible study and message is simply entitled, uh, Many, Many Takele You Farsen. And, of course, those are the words that were written on the wall. And in our last time together, we left King Belshazzar and more than a thousand party guests. It's interesting how the archaeologists have found great halls that would hold at least a thousand people. And he had a thousand guests at his party that night. And they were enjoying themselves and had a great orgy that he had prepared to honor his gods, but also to blaspheme the God of heaven. So all this was pre-planned and all of it's going on. And his grandfather, though, Nebuchadnezzar, had gotten God's blessing when he had gotten saved about 20 years previous to this. Think about that. About 20 years had passed now between the time that Nebuchadnezzar believed on the Lord and got saved. And now we have 20 years later. And Nebuchadnezzar's son and his son's son knew very little about the workings of God in the past. You know, that is a sad commentary. It honestly is. It's a sad commentary that the knowledge of the Lord was not passed down from one family member to the next. Somebody should have taken responsibility for that. And how sad that is that his son and his son's son had no knowledge of the goodness and the greatness of God. And so Belshazzar had been basking in his grandpa's uh, blessings, not really knowing where they came from. Think about that. Not really knowing where they came from. You read in the Bible often where God blessed someone because of someone else. And here we have Belshazzar basking in these great blessings because his grandfather knew the Lord, but yet he did not know the Lord. And Babylon had once again become a strong city uh, with walls that were said to be 350 feet high and 87 feet thick, if you can believe that. That's huge. What kind of a city was that? The river Euphrates, and it ran diagonally all the way through Babylon, and the great brass gates uh, controlled the entrances to the city. All those different things were going on. And Belshazzar had been lulled to sleep living in a false security. Over 350 feet tall walls, 87 foot thick walls, and oh, he's safe from everything, right? As someone said one time, you can run, but you can't hide. And the truth is, God does not care to have his name blasphemed, and it's amazing. You know, when the Lord says in the New Testament that he has honored his name, you think about that. And he has Old Testament truth that says we're not to take his name in vain. And here we have Belshazzar doing all of those things. 
And so I want you to notice with me in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 3, this is, this is sort of where Belshazzar was now living. It says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as, tra as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. And the, this New Testament truth surely applies now to Belshazzar. It's all there. The Lord's word is consistent from one testament to the next. It is true from one testament to the next. The principles of God's word are, are valid from one testament to the next. And here we have in the New Testament the very thing that is happening with Belshazzar. Well, what happened next was this. Our opening text indicated that Belshazzar's guests did not immediately see the hand nor the writing on the wall. And uh, it was located back behind them. But they did see Belshazzar. Did you notice how it described his fear? It says that his knees were shaken together. His knees were, were smiting one another. Why? Because he's scared to death. And by the way, you would be too if you saw what he saw. Then they heard him cry out literally a shriek. And he wanted his astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers to come and tell him what was written on the wall and to interpret it for him, but they could not do it. And once again, we find a tremendous uh, parallel from the Old Testament to the New Testament and back again. And we've got to be reminded that people that don't know the Lord do not have an understanding of the word of God. And say, what was written on the wall? It was the word of God. It's just sort of like what Jesus wrote in the sand. Remember on the story in the Bible? People are always wondering what it was. Everybody guesses, was it the man uh, who was guilty? Was he writing down a name or all the rest of it? I, I really don't know. We all have our surmisings. We all have the things that we think it was. But whatever it was, it was the word of God because Jesus wrote it. Well, here, whatever was written on the wall was the word of God. And God wrote it down for him. But you see, unsaved people do not have a spiritual understanding. They do not have that tuning in part in their brains. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, and don't forget this, it says, but the natural man receiveth not the things that of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. They have no judgment of the Word of God, because the Word of God judges them. Don't miss this. That's a New Testament principle, but we've already found it. Remember when, uh, you remember when Nebuchadnezzar could not understand his dream? He could not understand what God had given him, and he called in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and all the other wise men, and they couldn't even tell him his dream, nor could they interpret it. They had no spiritual understanding. Those without the Holy Spirit indwelling in them cannot possibly get it. Can I use that terminology? They just can't get it. Why not? Because they don't have that. It's like trying to tune in an AM station on an FM receiver. It's like trying to tune in an FM station on an AM receiver. You can't tune it in because it's not made for that particular signal. An unsaved person does not have the capacity to understand spiritual things. I've had people tell me about so-and-so, a theologian that may have written something about the Bible. And my first question is, was, was that individual saved? Were they saved? We don't know that. I mean, there's all kinds of authors out there that have written all kinds of things. Now, forgive me for picking on the Calvinists tonight, but I'm only going to pick on them just a little bit. You can't find Mr. Calvin's salvation testimony in any of his writings. And I've challenged Calvinists to find it for me and tell me about it. He stepped out of the Catholic Church. He walked away from what he believed before, but it doesn't tell us anything about his faith in Jesus Christ. And that disturbs me. But he's also the man that came up and simply said, God chooses some for heaven and some for hell, which is a damnable doctrine uh, that is not taught anywhere in scripture, anywhere. And in my own personal opinion, does not belong even in the pale of orthodoxy. And I mean that with everything that is in me. Having studied Calvinism, I believe with all of my being that that is 100% accurate. Now listen very, very carefully. These unsaved people did not have the capacity. Belshazzar did not know the Lord. His astrologers did not know the Lord. His Chaldean people that he called in that were supposed to be these wise individuals, they did not know the Lord. And the soothsayers did not know the Lord either. So therefore, none of them had the capacity to understand even what God had written. Now, I know there's a lot of good men and women out there that are not saved and they believe they have some spiritual insight. But my first question is always this, was, is that individual born again? 
We don't know if those theologians are born again. We have no idea if they know the Lord. We know they studied the Bible. We know they studied the word. We know that they have written some things down. But do we know that they actually know that they know that they know the Lord as their personal Savior? We do not know that. These so-called wise men could not interpret that mysterious handwriting on the wall. And Belshazzar had to know what it said. And he foolishly offered these men, uh, if anybody could explain it, a position in his kingdom of being the third ruler. Did you see that? As we read it a moment ago, I said, you can do this. You can be a, have a third part of it. You can be a leader. He had no idea that in only a few hours, he would not even be alive. Had no idea. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, the word of God says, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. The next generation would be wise to make sure it listens to what the older generation is saying. Because in many cases, they've been there and done that. And the Bible says that we ought to pay respect to those who are older than us only in the case of whether or not they walk in wisdom. And there are many people that are older and wiser than us who've been there and done that. And we need to listen to their counsel. Now, to the mysterious handwriting on the wall. All that was to bring us to the handwriting on the wall. I think if I would have been in that room, well, first of all, I would be dead now <laughs> because that was a long time ago. But if I would have been in that room, I would have been scared to death to see this. I really would have. And by the way, so would you. It doesn't matter if you're born again or not. Seeing something spooky. You remember when Jesus was walking on the water and Peter said, there's a ghost out there. And Jesus said, no, it's me. He said, well, if it is, you have asked me to come out and, and be with you. And he said, well, come on out. The water's fine. And boy, did Peter find out it was. But they thought it was a spirit, and it scared them. And remember when Jesus showed up in the room when all the, after he had been crucified and risen from the dead, and they were all there gathered because they were afraid for their lives? And the Bible says Jesus just showed up in a locked room. What was Jesus' first words? Peace. Be not afraid. <laughs> Why did he say that? Because they were without peace, and they were afraid. You see somebody come through a wall, let me tell you what, you'd be scared too. So what about this mysterious handwriting on the wall that would have scared every one of us to death? Number one, what it said, look at verse chapter 5 and verse 25. It says, and this is the writing that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'll stand corrected if I'm not, but I've always pronounced it just exactly that way. Number two, what it meant. So if you look, if you would please, beginning in verse 26, he explains what it means. And then we're going to take a look at the language itself. He says, this is the interpretation of the thing. Mini, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Perez, or Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given unto the Medes and the Persians. Now, meany, meany, because it's repeated, it means numbered, numbered, okay? Meany, meany means numbered, numbered. And God repeats it for emphasis, and it literally meant this, numbered, yea, ended. In other words, this is the end of the line for you, pal. God was, was telling him his fate. He was telling him his fate. And it's referenced, by the way, let me show you this. Uh, if you want to keep your finger where it's at and go back to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 27, I'll give you a moment to go there. Because of what this literally means, being numbered, yea, ended. And uh, it's a reference found in Jeremiah, chapter 27, in verse 7. And it says, And all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until... The very time, there's the phrase from the language, of his land is come, and many, and then many nations and great kings shall serve themselves of him. The phrase, the very time, speaks of an appointed time for the end. In other words, it's over with. It's going to be done. And that's what he's saying here when he says, numbered, numbered, your number is up. Have you ever heard the phrase, somebody says, well, your number's up? Of course you've heard that. You may have even said it. I know you've heard it but at least you've, you've uh, you said it at one time or another, his number is up. That comes from the Bible, literally here, numbered, numbered, if your time is up. And so uh, the phrase, in the very time, speaks of an appointed end, and it is referred to in Daniel chapter 2. So go back to Daniel now, just for a moment, chapter 2 and verse 39, where it is prophesied that an inferior nation was going to one day rule. 
The Bible tells us that when God prophesies something, it will come to pass. He will accomplish where he sends it. The Bible says in Daniel 2.39, it says, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. So there's the prophecy, and here it is fulfilled with Belshazzar. He's about to lose his kingdom. God says, your number is up, pal. What had he done? He had blasphemed God. God does not take blasphemy lightly. Daniel had already received a prophecy concerning this, and he mentions that in chapter 8, where the ram mentioned in the prophecy represented the kings of the Medo-Persian Empire. We'll get to that in time. So the Bible is just coming together one piece at a time. Now, what about the word tekel? We've looked at meanie meany. Now I want you to look at tekel, if you would, please. It means weighed. It means weighed. Of course, so we did see that where he said that in the scripture itself. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances. And then the word eupharsin is, uh, is, is two things that are put together, okay? It means literally divided and broken. And, of course, we saw that in the prophecy. Uh, and let me read it to you again. It says, and thou art found wanting, Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given, you see. But notice what it says here, if you would, please. You is a conjunction, meaning and. In other words, the fact that it, this is the end is not the end of it yet because there's something that God was going to add to it. And he says, and the word and, and farson, or, uh, or perez, as it's mentioned there in the verse, means divided and broken. So Belshazzar was about to lose it all. He was about, he had no idea that when he threw that orgy that night that he was going to die had no idea. And so Daniel had already been given this prophecy, and we understand that. So that many, many take you farson, God simply says to Belshazzar, this is it. Your number is up. It's over with. We've gone as far. Now, he'd given him a long time. Think about that. Two generations had passed. He had given him a long time to learn. He had given him a long time to, to follow what was right. But did he? No, he did not. Now, let me show you this. Number one, I said tonight what it said. Number two, what it meant. But number three, uh, what it did. Look, if you would please, at chapter 5, verses 30 and 31 of Daniel. Daniel chapter 5, verses 30 and 31, it says, And in, it says, in that night was Belshazzar, the king of the Chaldeans, slain. And Darius, uh, the Median, took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. Very amazing thing here. It happened just as God said that it would. What God says, he means, and it happened just like God said it would. He would have been wise to, father in, to follow in his grandfather's footsteps, but he did not. But his grandfather apparently did not teach it to his son, who in turn could not teach it to his son's son. You know, I'm not sure everything that my children are going to do with what we've taught them. I'd like to be able to say, it's going to be this way. can't say that. I'd like to think that my children will teach to their grandchildren the things that they learned. That's what I would like to think. Is it going to happen? I don't know that there's a guarantee. But there would be less of a chance if we hadn't. There would be less of a chance had we not sat down with our children and read with them God's word. There would be less of a chance if we had not sat down with our kids uh, and read through the entire Bible by the time all of them had graduated from school. There would be less of a chance if we did not have them in church. Be less of a chance if we had not taught them the word of God in Sunday school. And thank God for every Sunday school teacher and children's church worker who had a part in my children's upbringing. They would have much less of a chance of being right with the Lord or following the Lord or anything else. I want my grandchildren and we now have 15 of them things. Can you believe that? Man, I'm here to tell you what, that's like keeping a dozen ping pong balls underwater at the same time with two hands. Get noisy. But I'd like to think that every one of my grandkids are going to be able to hear about Jesus and learn about his love and learn about salvation at an early age and not be like these silly parents out there that say, well, I'm not going to teach my kid anything. I'm not going to make them go to church. I'm going to let them pick on their own. I'll guarantee you they'll pick on their own. If it's not important to you, it certainly will not be a priority with them. And so, therefore, we need to make sure that we're doing our part and let me just say this, a phrase that I learned from some of my friends, if you're still breathing, there's still hope. 
and you can do it. And you can be that influence in those young people's lives. You say, what if they don't listen? Doesn't matter. I'm always reminded of Chuck Colson, who's now in heaven. You remember him from the Watergate days. Chuck Colson ended up getting saved, praising the Lord for that. As he was speaking in a stadium one time and was walking out, some young people, some college-age kids made fun of him because he was preaching. And all he did was turn around and look at the crowd of young people, and he said, the wages of sin is death. That's all he said. Turned and walked away. I think it was six months later that he received a letter from one of those young people that was in that crowd saying he was in that crowd. And when Chuck Colson turned around and said the wages of sin is death, he said he couldn't, he couldn't escape it. And that young man ended up getting saved. Never underestimate the power of the sharp two-edged sword of the word of God. And what had happened, and if, if, Bel, if, Bel, if uh, Nebuchadnezzar had shared with his son, and his son would have shared with Belshazzar, maybe this story wouldn't have been included in the word of God. But the truth of the matter is he knew nothing about the God of heaven. And that's a sad commentary, a very sad commentary, because it happened just as God said that it would. Now, God judged Belshazzar for the same sin that he had judged his grandfather uh, for Nebuchadnezzar. I want you to go back to Daniel 5, verses 20, if you would, please. We're going to start there. God judged Belshazzar for the same sin he had judged his grandfather. Very interesting. And it says here in verse 20, it says, But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, and he was disposed uh, from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Now go down to verse 22. And thou his son, O Belshazzar, hast not humbled thine heart, though thou knewest all this but hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of the house before thee. And thou and thy lords and thy wives and thy concubines uh, have drunk wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold and brass and iron, wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. And the God in whose hand thy breath is and whose uh, are all thy ways hast thou not glorified. It's interesting. He had some knowledge, but he didn't have heart, but he didn't follow any of it. Didn't follow any of it. And he was being judged for the same thing that Nebuchadnezzar was going to be judged for, was judged for. What goes around comes around. It would seem from reading this story that every generation is apparently doomed to learn uh, the lessons on pride for themselves, and they need to learn. The Bible indicates otherwise, though, for each succeeding generation is supposed to learn from the preceding generation's mistakes. That's what we're supposed to do. But it didn't happen with Belshazzar. It didn't happen with those who followed. He lost his kingdom. It was all destroyed. Why else would God warn us about pride if we were not to try to avoid its consequences? Studying in the book of Proverbs, you find out pride is just one of those things that God hates immensely. And these men were lifted up in themselves and full of pride and full of themselves. No wonder the Bible says you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he shall lift you up, you see. And just a word to the wise, learn well the lessons of the older generations, those who've gone on before us. And I realize I'm in my 60s, and I realize all of us here have some age behind us, and we don't have near as many days in front of us as we do behind us. There's still men that we can learn from, from their wisdom. I, the mistakes of uh, Solomon's son Rehoboam, forsaking the advice and the guidance of the older counselors, and then running only with his peers. What a foolish mistake that was. He ruined the reputation of God in that kingdom. And he ruined a kingdom and split it. Because he followed the wrong advice. And would be wise to follow the right advice. So don't be filled with pride. So much pride that you think you have to try all the things for yourself. And learn all the lessons the hard way. I have said this before and I'm going to say it till the day I die. The school of hard knocks is not the best school to graduate from. If you have to go there, graduate. Okay, get your degree if you have to go there. But that's not the best school to graduate from. I was sharing with someone just recently, 
And I said, when my parents said you shouldn't do this, I was just dumb enough as a young person to believe them. You hear what I said? Just dumb enough to believe them. Don't run with that kind of a crowd. Don't date that kind of a girl. Don't go to that kind of a place. Uh, don't believe that kind of trash. And when my mom and dad said that, I believed them. And I'm glad that I did. Saved me a lot of heartache. But I did not follow their advice on everything. Bottom line is, is Belshazzar did not follow anything that was in his past teaching. You know, I'm sure he could have asked. I'm sure he could have learned. Why was he being blessed? But no, he got caught up in himself. And the Bible tells us that he got caught up in his own pride, in his own self. And I guess he thought he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps. Maybe that's what he thought he did. I don't know. Shall we stand? Heavenly Father.